It is May the 17th, 2021, and this is Curiously Polar. Hello and welcome back. This is the show about all things very north and very south. My name is Chris Marquardt, and this is Henry. Hi there. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. We have uh, another North Pole centric episode ready for you. So let's dive right in. Before we do that, of course, um, we have our polar newsreel, a batch of interesting things that happened just now. And uh, let's let me just bring that up and let's get started right away. Um, new stuff from the. Uh, the space above us right exactly we talked about it like the in the last episode or second last i'm not sure we had the um news reel about russia um laying down a cable to provide um, high-speed internet to the eastern part of uh arctic russia and now there's also a new batch of satellites um, being launched and um yeah bringing some broadband connectivity services to some of the world's hardest to reach places and that's pretty awesome um for the connectivity in the arctic uh because as of now there is not so much um density of of, of satellite networks providing um internet yet so that's uh, certainly a big development this is uh, interesting because uh we're talking about one web which is a british communication company who is launching satellites to well, cover the planet. There are multiple of these happening right now. One is uh, Starlink, which has, I think, the by far biggest amount of satellites up uh, in the sky right now. But that doesn't really cover the Arctic just yet. They are planning to do that. Um, I think they have the first batch of satellites actually going over the Arctic. But it kind of stops at 53 degrees north. So it's not really that high up. And uh, same with OneWeb. They're all uh, planning to cover the poles as well right now the poles are yeah fairly fairly well they're not satellite free but uh, at least not as well covered so there is stuff happening a second thing on our polar newsreel is um another uh, space topic another space topic yes Yay. rocket factory <laughs> augsburg from germany what's this about it's, it's about um, something. actually, <laughs> it's about um, uh, a space port, and I'm sure we talked about that when um, we met for the first time on board of Togo in northern Norway, mm -hmm. when we talked about the Andoya um, space area on Andoya on the island of Andoya. There is a, a company that actually yeah provides a a rocket launch pad. And that's called Andoya Space. And the rocket factory Augsburg is actually uh, producing rockets. And they did so for the past years. And now they're actually uh, secured um, with a contract, some space, some launch space for their first rocket in 2022. It's the maiden flight, flight of the company's um, RFA-1. It's, it's interesting. A, I, I it, mean, it's I proof. I'm German and uh, I do not connect Augsburg with rocket factories. So, um, interesting. You don't. Interesting. So, um, <laughs> a bit more uh, a serious topic. Uh, the uh, Arctic Today has this one here. The okay, you can you can pronounce names better. There is a COVID nineteen outbreak somewhere in is that Greenland? No, that's uh, Nunavut. That's Canada. Uh, okay. Iqaluit. That's the the main. Um, settlement, the largest uh, settlement in Nunavut, the, the capital of Nunavut, if you like. And they declared a state of emergency in uh, response to the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Uh, yeah, that's um, a, a serious development, um, which they start, uh, or, yeah, which they immediately tried to uh, quarantine to really, to, to, yeah, limit this kind of outbreak. Because the medical, um, availabilities there are just very very limited that's something we have to take very serious there and um yeah I'm, I'm not even sure how the outbreak started but i somehow connect that to um a mining project close by which brought in um third party contractors travel but, um, travel is usually the culprit yeah yeah 
All right. Well, uh, next up on the newsreel, our uh, favorite volcano in Iceland is, is is quite active, isn't it? <laughs> it had, has changed its pattern tremendously. So what used to be just like an ongoing um, eruption or yeah, um, effusive eruption where it just really just uh, creates lava fountains um, over and over again. Um, those lava fountains stopped for a while and then um, created a pulse. So now you actually, in particularly in time-lapse videos, you can really see how the volcano starts puffing. It's um, not like a thing that um, ejects lava uh, throughout the like uh, the entire time it's not continuous it is more like exactly it, it plugs itself and then it goes boom sort of exactly that's a theory yeah. of uh, of yeah. some of the scientists is that it actually gets plucked somehow that the um material that just got um uh, produced is not um flowing that freely anymore and then when it builds enough pressure it's a little bit like the geysir which is like a water um version of that volcano um, then just builds up enough pressure and that pressure just gets released by fountains and those fountains and that's crazy are going up to 300 meters by now into wow. the sky 300 meters is something that is actually um, really an issue for the air traffic because we talk about the area close to the international airport in Iceland and the other thing is it's also pretty amazing because you can see it from far far away and you brought something up there. <laughs> so this came in from Scott Duncan, and it's, I think, by a photographer uh, named Luri Belegrushi. Belegrushi, and uh, it is a bit of a photographic trick because things are not as close as they seem. So what we see here is the, uh, the famous church in Reykjavik, and behind it... You can see the video of the eruptions, and it it feels like everything is really close together. Um, now, how far is that volcano away from Reykjavik? It's thirty six kilometers. See, and what's happening here is they are they are very far away, and they use a very, the photographer is far away from Reykjavik, and uses a very strong telephoto lens, and that kind of compresses the depth to, to together so it looks like this is right next to the church it is not it is 36 kilometers away but um it makes it visually very close to each other which is i mean that's an amazing piece of video it's just it's, it's an amazing long, skyline yeah. add-on really yeah <laughs> so yeah hmm okay that's i think it for this week's uh polar news rail real Real? Real. That's the word. For real. Um, real for real. <laughs> Let us um, dive into the scramble for the North Pole. What are we talking about today? We talked about that already briefly. We had a um, few episodes back a topic. And um, if you also remember, I think that was part of the newsreel, um, media outlets just a few weeks back, just came up with the alarming uh, Russia uh, filed an extension to its claim to the Arctic Ocean. And the media were quoting uh, Canada's foreign minister with uh, what he said, you cannot claim any more. And that re raised a number of flags, um, obviously, talking about the Arctic and Russia claiming. Uh, Russia appears in, in Western media as the big bad giant in the first place. I mean, if you project that then to geopolitics in the Arctic, it uh, takes its way, of course. Um, diving into that, uh, of course, raises the question, who actually owns the North Pole and why is that important? We had a similar episode about the Northwest Passage um, a few episodes back. I think that was one of the very first episodes we've done together. So um, who actually owns the North Pole? What do you think? I, I I would expect it to be similar to the South Pole. There's like different claims and different pieces of the like a, like a I envision a pie chart of sorts with different slices. I mean that that is like the big problem, right? When you have a, a globe sphere and um, you're used to um, cut pieces out of that uh, according to the latitude or longitude lines, they all get together at the poles. So it might be a little bit difficult <laughs> to define uh, territories there. Yeah, but uh, beginning in 1925, um, numerous countries have claimed parts of the Arctic. And that was based on the so-called sector principle. And that actually extends territorial claims along 
the long longitudes of um, the own land territory towards the North Pole. Um, Canada was the very first country to do so. Um, they were followed by the Soviet Union just the, the year later, and then Norway as well. Later, those claims, they have been um, based more on scientific evidence and the legal framework of the so-called United Nations Convention um, on the Law of the Sea. And that is um, particularly interesting for us. But um, what is the very first, uh, first moment for you to remember consciously um, the North Pole being mentioned in media? I don't remember when that started. For me, probably, that... probably probably something something to do with uh, Santa Claus as a kid. <laughs> I think that's that's when the North Pole became a thing for me. Okay, for me, I can very clearly target that to to uh, one event, and that was back in two thousand and seven, when Russia planted a flag at the North Pole. Mm -hmm. This event marks a huge change in in media coverage, um, but also in the public perception of um, both the Arctic in general and the North Pole um, in particular. Let me see. Is that the first visual that you gave me? Mm -hmm. The Barnes That's Observer. Here, there's a photo of the plant uh, of the planting of the flag, and it looks like a robot arm is planting. That was happening there. It's a um, a manned submersible, a submarine uh, that was part of a larger expedition. They went down and planted a tiny little titan flag on the on, north pole on the ground of the sea under yes wow and there was a there was a big debate about that um if that was marking territory and i remember also canada was very strong in their reaction just saying we are not living in the 15th century any longer you can't uh, just go somewhere and plant a flag <laughs> and say it's mine um and russia just defended itself and just that we not marked the territory we just Uh, followed the tradition of people who reach spot no other human being has reached before, like climbing Mount Everest the first time and um, just pointing a flag there. Um, and they were actually the first humans who dived down to the North Pole and planted the flag. Yeah, that was the, the basic story behind that. But before 2007, the, like the general public, um, they largely perceived the Arctic as huge, white, empty Uh, place as a desert basically with the iconic main predator the polar bear and the polar bear more and more got threatened by melting ice due to uh, man-induced climate change and a small group of adventurous people came um, up to greenland canada or svalbard to see the the so-called arctic with their own eyes but for the vast majority of people the north pole always has been something very very abstract very far away And with Russia now descending with a man submersible all the way to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, this abstract North Pole suddenly became very tangible. And further, the geopolitical dimension of the Arctic, which have always been um, yeah, very, very present for, like for the entire globe, they suddenly brought to the fore quite drastically, uh, of course, always in the light of the classical, classical East-West conflict with Uh, Russia as the evil villain. And that's um, like a very ongoing theme that comes back. But let's uh, take a step back and have a look at the Arctic. Um, unlike Antarctica, which is more like a landmass covered in ice, the Arctic consists of an ocean up to 5,000 meters deep, has um, a number of ocean basins that form actually the Arctic Ocean, um, surrounded by the foothills of Uh, the continents and we have on one side the Eurasian mainland and we have actually also a card prepared for that or a map there you go uh, we have in the middle the blue dark blue pile that's the 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 abyss of the arctic ocean then we have the big white p that's greenland on the right side uh, you see eurasia with russia uh, finland norway sweden and on the left side you see arctic canada and alaska and of course greenland and You can clearly see the the blue deep sea ocean basin is surrounded by the continental slopes on the right side of Eurasia and on the left side of North America. And you also see the two world main ocean. They drain into the Arctic Ocean on top of the world. 
The one is the Pacific Ocean, which you find in the in the north on the top of the uh, picture. And that runs through the very, very shallow Bering Strait. We're talking about um, an average of 50 to 100 meters depth. That's really? not much. That's shallow. Yes. Wow. The Bering Strait is one of the shallowest seas we have. It's, an, it's, it's really amazing. That also means that the turn, turnover of the, um, uh, of the ocean swell just reaches all the way to the ground. So it, it affects the entire water column in the Bering Strait, making it very, very productive. And the other one is where the Atlantic Ocean cuts into the um, Arctic Ocean. And that's what you see at the bottom. There's another dark blue area, and that's the Fram Strait. That's D the Darker area is deeper, right? Yeah. Exactly. Dark blue is deeper than yeah. the, the light blue. And that's the area between Greenland and um Scandinavia and it narrows down between Greenland and uh Svalbard and that is like the Fram Strait named after this very very famous ship of Fridtjof Nansen and that's the only deep sea access to the Arctic Ocean that's uh, very interesting so you actually when you think about heavy and uh, and lighter water warm and cold water you see that the heavier water only can exit or access the Arctic Ocean through the Fram Strait, while the lighter water then also can go through the uh, Bering Strait, the Chukchi Plateau, and then the Bering Strait. And that's uh, pretty awesome. So the major stakeholders are the eight countries that actually form the boundaries um, around um, the Arctic, the so-called coastal states, and that's Canada, Denmark, um, as representative for Greenland, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the United States, which represents Alaska, or is represented by Alaska. And that's the so-called Arctic 8. And then you have the Arctic Ocean um, bordering countries, that's only five, namely Canada, Denmark, uh, Norway, Russia, and the United States. And the five countries surrounding the Arctic uh, Ocean, they are limited to a territorial sea of 12 nautical miles. That's roughly t uh, 22 kilometer, uh, kilometers. And beyond that, they have a so-called exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles um, adjacent to their coast measured from uh, declared baselines on the, uh, on the shore. And all of that is filed with the UN. And that's kind of uh, important to understand how uh, territorial claims in the ocean work. Yeah, we take like the coastal area, we, we, we take the coastline. From there, we have um, the territorial sea, which is only 22 kilometers wide. But beyond that, we have 200 nautical miles, another 370 kilometers, which is the exclusive economic zone. So no other Hold country. On. We have a graphic here from the Tufts University. That oh, might yeah, help. exactly. Yeah. yeah, on the left side, we have the continent, uh, uh, not the continent, we have the landmass. Then you have the very um, small section, the territorial zone or territorial waters, and then the longer 370 kilometers um, economic exclusive zone. So no other country is actually allowed without permission to, um, yeah, to, to exploit any kind um, of, um, yeah, of economics in the uh, in that zone so that would include drilling and other things there exactly that means yeah. fishing that means fishing um, too, yeah. ground resources um yeah any kind of um resources in there the waters beyond the territorial seas 12 uh, nautical mile zone um, of the coastal states are co uh, considered the so-called high seas or international waters that doesn't define any other status than that we have a different a law that is um, responsible there. That sounds very, very technical, so let's get a better idea about those terms. Um, first of all, uh, all of these terms are defined in the so-called United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea, or in short, UNCLOS. That's a very... very <laughs> a very easy to remember, <laughs> and for especially to speak uh, acronym there. Yeah, UNCLOS is very easy um, to remember, but usually it's Convention of the Law of the Seas or Law of the Sea Convention, which we yeah. refer to. Um, it is one of only five so-called international ownership treaties. And those international ownership treaties, they uh, encompass the Antarctic Treaty System, 
the Outer Space Treaty, the Moon Treaty, International Waters or Convention um, of the High Seas, what we are talking about now, and the Convention on the Law of the Sea. The Law of the Sea Convention defines, um, and now we're getting a, a little bit technical again, um, that defines the rights and responsibilities of nations with uh, respect to their use of the world's oceans. So they are establishing guidelines for, for businesses, for the environment, uh, the management of marine natural resources. They were developed in 1973 um, up to 1982. And the convention was opened for signature on the 10th of December 1982. And now there is a long period of about 12 years. And it took until the 16th of November 1994 when the Convention on the Law of the Seas actually went into force. The convention has been ratified until now by 168 parties, which include 167 states and the European Union, which is like a block of states. Mm -hmm. um, interesting to mention here is that the United States have not ratified the convention. And that's a particularly interesting when we come later um, to the Arctic Ocean. But it's also interesting from a historical perspective because the United States, they helped significantly to shape the convention and um, all the subsequent revisions of the convention. And it has signed in 1994 the agreement of implementation, but it has not signed the convention itself. And the reason for that is that hardliners in the US Senate are concerned that the convention will um, subject the United States to stricter and, in their view, unnecessary env environmental standards. Um, that's one of the factors. But in general, they say that the accession to the convention uh, by the US would provide no further benefits, um, not already available to, to the US, while creating, obviously, then an unnecessary burden and risks. At the same time, the United States um, does not need to join the convention in order to access oil and gas resources on its extended continental shelf, um, as we've seen in the Arctic or in the Gulf of Mexico. So it's already happening through the exclusive environmental zone, which is um, defined in a different convention. However, not ratifying the convention um, on the law of the seas keeps the US from having a direct voice in the bodies of that convention, like the International Tribunal uh, for the Law of the Sea, the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, and the International Seabed Authority. And that sounds also very, very exciting. And I'm very sure there are <laughs> some lawyers who really give, go crazy on that. Um, for most people, that really doesn't play a big role. But for the supporters of the convention, uh, within the U.S. Senate, um, UNCLOS reflects important U.S. interests, particularly regarding uh, restraints on the economic exclusive zone, um, but also on continental shelf resources, uh, the innocent passage across territorial waters, passage rules for transiting straits, and archipelagic sea, uh, sea lanes. And, of course, the high sea freedoms. And that's very, very important um, when you look at the economy of the United States. But the strategic necessity of preserving U.S. national interests uh, via the accession of UNCLOS is most, most evident in particular the evolving water situation of the Arctic. And under the current international law, the North Pole and the region of the Arctic Ocean um, surrounding it are not owned by any country. So the waters and the sea bottom that is not confirmed to be extended continental shelf beyond the exclusive economic zone. That means we have the possibility to extend the exclusive economic zone, at least for the bottom, not for the entire water column. So we're not talking about fishes, but about the bottom resources. We can extend that if we can prove that our continental shelf reaches further than the 370 kilometers of the exclusive economic zone I from our coastline. Interesting, the whole column thing. Um, I mean, it is it's something similar with with uh, the space above your house. You have a, a plot of land, and uh, um, it ends somewhere above you because then there is airspace and there's airplanes, and and you cannot tell the airplanes to fly around you unless you are a big government and have very good reasons. So, it, 
Indeed, really, and that's also different yeah. uh, the closer you live to the airport, by the way. A, sim a similar um, thing is how, how, how uh, deep can you, how much ground under you belongs to you, because... I've read an interesting story about people building big tunnel systems under their houses. So there's a whole, in quotes, subculture. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So ocean floor. Okay, let's uh, let's continue. Well, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but let's no, continue. no, it's, it's very good because um, we have a technical limitation to how deep we can get uh, when it comes to exploiting the uh, economic resources or the natural resources in the bottom of the sea. And that's there is literally no hole that um, went further than 10 kilometers um, in depth. So there is a technical limitation on how deep we can actually go. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we will overcome that uh, over time. And then the next issue will be, does that also go all the way down to the core or not? Um, that will be discussions of further generations, I'm sure. But let's go back to um, to that paperwork. So upon the ratification of the, um, the, the Convention on the Law of the Sea, a country has then a 10-year period to actually make a claim to extend their continental shelf. Um, and if that's validated, that gives the exclusive rights to the resources um, on the seabed and below the seabed. And that extends basically then the, the shelf area, what I um, just mentioned before. So you have, after ratifying that uh, Convention of the Seas, 10 years time to actually do so. And the first ones who actually did were um, Norway, if I, and no, Canada, I'm just looking that up at the moment. However, all the, the four biggest countries or the biggest stakeholders like Norway, Russia, Canada, and Denmark, all of them, they launched projects to provide scientific base for seabed claims. So they actually really um, enrolled scientific research expeditions to figure out what is the geology um, of the seafloor in the Arctic. And um, for example, the, um, the Mosaic expedition also made um, a bathymetry uh, measurement of the seafloor again uh, the Russians did before and so on and so forth so all those beautiful um, bathymetry maps they are not only due to uh, satellites they are largely due to the operations of ships and there we can see it um, on the screen right now there are a number of disputes in the Arctic Sea region for also the same amount of different reasons Canada, Denmark, Norway, Russia, and the United States all regard parts of the Arctic seas as national waters or even international waters. These disputes, or there are more disputes um, regarding what kind of passages actually constitute international seaways and the rights to it, or if it still is um, national water. For example, the legal status of the Northwest Passage, which we see here, the, the red lines on the left side of the of the map, um, they are disputed. And we talked about that in episode um, uh, 57, who owns the, uh, the Northwest Passage. Canada considers it to be part of their internal waters because it goes between the uh, Canadian Arctic archipelago of the um, thousands of islands that form that. Um, the US, however... And most maritime nations, to be fair, consider the routes of the Northwest Passage to be an international strait, which means that foreign vessels have the right of a so-called transit passage. In such a regime, Canada would have the right to enact fishing and environmental regulation um, and also fiscal and smuggling laws as well as laws intended for the safety of, ship, uh, of shipping, but not the right to close the entire passage. That's a difference uh, to um, national waters. In addition, uh, in addition, the the environmental regulations um, allowed under the Convention on the Law of the Seas are not as robust as those allowed if the Northwest Passage it would be considered as part of Canada's internal waters. The scene looks very similar on the other side, on the east side here, the right one, where you have the yellow line, which is the Northeast Passage or Northern Sea Route. And Russia considers portions of the Northern Sea Route um, also 
national waters, particularly the portions of the sea route which encompass only navigational routes through waters within uh, Russia's Arctic economic um, zone, exclusive economic zone. So it's basically the area between Novaya Zemlya um, towards the Bering Strait and also the internal waters in the Kara, uh, Vilkitsky and Sonikov Straits, which are between uh, larger island groups and the mainland. In the Before Sea, uh, there is also an ongoing dispute between the US and Canada, and that exists for a so-called wedge-shaped slice on the international boundary. It's a piece of pizza, basically. And we also have a, um, a graphic just for that piece of pizza. Um, is that the one here? That is the piece of pizza we're talking about. Um, the one exactly. on the right top? Exactly. Um, the Canadian, so it's actually the, the boundary between the Canadian territory of Yukon and Alaska, which is a US, a US federal state. The Canadian position here is that the maritime boundary should extend the land boundary in a straight line. The American position, however, is that the maritime boundary should extend along a path equidistant from the coast to the two nations. So the area supposedly contains oil reserves, so we ah. might understand <laughs> why that so, is. So, so what's what's exactly happening then? If one country, if Canada says, no, this is ours, and the United States says uh, it is ours as well, um, they, they're not going to war over that. No, they, they actually negotiate um, about that um, bilaterally. And if they not come to a conclusion for, for now, for example, there's a moratorium of, um, of exploit, exploitation of the I area see. for both countries. So they actually um, yeah, consider it not existent. But um, it's going to be very difficult to, to find that. Right. Um, I'm, I, I'm re I really find it difficult to follow the um, argument line of argument from the from the US here, um, but that's a yeah that's a long long story here. <laughs> that has never stopped them. <laughs> no, <laughs> the, the, that has really <laughs> never stopped them not having a good line of argument. Uh, there are resources this... involved, and resources are something Crucial. that is very desirable. Yeah, exactly. And after this um, rather funny uh, pizza piece, we have another funny dispute which involves again Canada but this time also Greenland and we have talked about that in episode 56. I remember that. Exactly. <laughs> How was that called? Hans Island. <laughs> exactly. It's the whiskey war on yes. Hans Island. <laughs> it's the bottle of whiskey. Uh, it's a one point. Which episode three... was that? We have to put this in the show notes. Um, I think it was 56. Okay I'll figure this out. And you just imagine, it's a 1.3 square kilometer sized barren rock. There is nothing on it. It's a barren rock in the middle of the Nara Strait. So it's in that particular area, 35 kilometers wide. And you have this island that's exactly in the middle of it. So the, the dotted line between the country or that marks the boundary between the countries goes exactly through that island. So both parties actually... Um, yeah, couldn't agree on who that island belongs to. And they started as a very funny um, way of dealing with the conflict. They actually, um, I think the, the Canadians started um, and visited, um, a member of the government visited the island, planted a Canadian flag and left a bottle of whiskey. And then the Danes came after, uh, I think a year later, planted the Danish flag and took Such the whiskey away and story. left some Danish spirit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bizarre story. And that went on for quite some time. It's not happening any longer. They're talking now <laughs> about it, but still okay. without any outcome. But it certainly gets more interesting when we look towards the North Pole. And the history of claims um, to the North Pole dates back to 1925. And Canada was the first nation to extend their own maritime boundaries northwards all the way to the North Pole, at least on paper. And that's the funny thing here. The claim was based on the um, so-called sector principle, which I um, talked about briefly in the very beginning. So 
the sector principle actually extends the territorial claims along the longitude line of your own land territory all the way to the North Pole. We think about the, the sphere, the, the globe of uh, planet Earth again. So you take the edges of your, <laughs> your outline borders um, of your land territory and you just draw that all the way up to the North Pole and you come to a big piece of pizza that ends on the North Pole. And by that, obviously, they also claim the North Pole. But just a year later, in 1926, the Soviet Union declared uh, the territory between two lines drawn uh, from west of Murmansk um, to the North Pole and from the eastern Chukchi Peninsula to the North Pole to be Soviet territory, also including the North Pole. Norway made a very similar sector claim um, in the same year following the extent of the archipelago of Svalbard. So they have been not as greedy and just uh, took the entire uh, Norway, but just um, Svalbard. <laughs> Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's how it started. Just to uh, keep that in mind, in the context of the Cold War, Canada then sent Inuit families to the far north in the high Arctic uh, relocation, um, partly to establish uh, ter ter territoriality, and that was a very important part for them. They had the idea of when you have people living there, you own it. And we have a similar situation in Antarctica where uh, Chile and Argentina are sending, have been sending families to, uh, to Antarctica, to the peninsula, to actually underline their claim. And that's what Canada actually did in the 70s. It's so this map, this map that we have on the screen right now looks really wild with all the different... Exactly, that's it, all the different claims and the different <laughs> colors. <laughs> this is just... Okay. So I think the um, the settlement of Resolute, for example, has been established uh, largely by relocated Inuit families. Um, Queen Elizabeth II, um, in her function as the Canadian monarch, she traveled in the nineteen uh, in, in 1970 through northern Canada, um, and the only reason for that journey was to actually support the claim of Canada in the Arctic and to really underline the claim of Canada um, to the water within the Canadian Arctic archipelago, which they consider to be internal waters, as we remember. And as we also know, that claim is disputed still today. And until 1999, the geographic North Pole, which is merely a non-dimensional dot, and like the major part of the Arctic Ocean had been generally considered to be international space, including um, the waters and the sea bottom. However, the, the adoption of that um, United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea has prescribed a process, a process which gives you tools at hand to actually submit claims to reinforce pre-existing claims. And that's particularly important here for the polar, uh, for the seabed of the polar region. And as mentioned before, States have ratified the convention, um, have then 10 years to form a claim or to make a claim to uh, to an extended continental sh shelf. And those claims must be then submitted to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, which in its own is a body of the United Nations. And they need to support that with geological evidence. So it's not just that you can just say, hey, um, I claim that because I think that looks awesome uh, on our maps but you have to um, <laughs> provide some <laughs> some evidence um, and that evidence needs to prove that the shelf effectively extends beyond the 200 nautical miles limit of the exclusive economic zone but just to be clear the commission does not define those borders it only judges the scientific validity of those claims so when we see um, Canada handing in a claim, then this commission does not say, yep, that's Canada's. It just says the scientific evidence that Canada provided um, leads to the conclusion that geographic or geologically, the North Pole um, belongs to parts of Canada. It is, however, very, very crucial to understand that claims to extended continental shelves do not grant exclusive rights in the water column it's only the sea bottom and the resources below so the access to the water column ends at the 200 nautical mile 
zone. So that's really where, where the story ends. So we are talking about here the access to the seafloor of an almost 5,000 meters deep Arctic basin. That's just and in the seafloor and in extension the resources that might be in the seafloor. Exactly. Yeah. That's very, very important to understand the actual meaning of the scramble for the North Pole. Russia then was the first country of the Arctic Five that has ratified the Convention uh, of the on the Law of the Seas in 1997. So it had time until 2007 to uh, to file a claim, and they actually did. And based on that, believe that the Eastern uh, Lomonos- Lomonosov Lomonosov Ridge and the Mandalayev Ridge are extensions of the Siberian continental shelf. So it's like the the, the major um, mountain range in the Arctic Basin is the Lomonosov Ridge. And they actually argued that's part of the um, shelf of um, of the Asian uh, Eurasian continent. And they claimed that it stretches all the way to the North Pole. In fact, it stretches all the way to Greenland, but they just claimed the way to the North Pole. Um, the Russian claim is based on a number of, of arguments. They actually brought in um, very interesting um, scientific data. However, the UN commissioner has not rejected or accepted that claim, but they recommended additional research to provide evidence. And in 2007, when the flag was planted, Russia organized an expedition called Arctica 2007 as part of the Russian program for the 2007-2008 International Polar Year, in which Russia then performed the first ever crude uh, descent to the ocean bottom at the North Pole. And that was the true achievement here. And that's why the planting the flag has to be seen differently from marking a territory as mine. It's more the achievement of sending humans down to that depth for the very first time. Which is quite an achievement, to be honest. It is an achievement. Yeah. And after that, um, after the submersible returned, they also... Um, established the drift ice uh, station North Pole 35 and we talked about the drift ice stations in a different episode already um, and that all of that was part of the Arctica 2007 expedition. The reaction of other countries bordering the Arctic Ocean were largely concerned and that's just due to the uh, remnants of the uh, Cold War. Particularly Canada was really, really um, uh, offended and just said, hey, we're not in the 15th century. You can't just go around plat flex and just claim that as your territory. But right after the expedition, um, Russia's Natural Resources Ministry, they published a preliminary result stating that the anal- analysis of the uh, crust um, they actually examined have confirmed that the crust structure of the Lomonosov Ridge corresponds to what they have found in the Russian Federation um, adjacent continental shelf. In 2013, Canada was the next filing its claim, but it took six more years to actually submit some supporting documents in 2019. And Canadian scientists completed 17 research expeditions into the Arctic Oceans in 2006. And Canada threw its metaphorical hat into the ring, arguing that science is on their side and in, in laying claim to almost half a million square miles of underwater Arctic territory based on the extent of its continental shelf, including, of course, then the North Pole. At the, th- uh, at the center of that debate is the 1,800 kilometers long uh, Lomonosov Ridge. So that's like the centerpiece of the Arctic Basin. It's a region um, at a depth of around 1,700 meters that runs Um, near the pole and it really bisects the Arctic Ocean. Um, The ridge is about the size of California and it's considered a promising source for oil and gas. And to establish their case, Canadian officials have submitted a 2,100 page report to uh, the Scientific Committee of the United Nations detailing the size and shape of the continental shelf along Canada's Arctic coastline. Denmark then, as the third party, filed its claim in 2014, covering an area of 895,000 square kilometers. And that extended all the way from Greenland past the North Pole to the limits of the Russian exclusive economic zone. And Denmark argues that the Lomonosov Ridge is in fact an extension of Greenland, unlike the Russian claim, which is generally limited 
to the Russian sector of the Arctic. So the Can't we just Rus go down there and have a look? I mean, yeah. <laughs> So let's, just, stopped, let's just look which, which part it is attached to and which part it isn't. The interesting part here is that the Russian claim stopped at the North Pole while the Danes went over the North Pole oh. all the way to the edge of the Russian oh. um, EEZ. <laughs> so that was very, very fancy. So in 2021, in April, so in fact only just a few weeks back, Russia has updated its claim on the Arctic Sea. And the new submission would push... Russia's claim all the way up to Canada's exclusive economic zone, an area 200 nautical miles from the coastline. So Russia's submission expands its original claim by about 705,000 square kilometers. And it seems that this is really a so-called maximalist submission. You basically cannot claim more. You really go to the edge of um, where the legal border of the other nation is already. So Russia's amended submission overlaps with those from Canada and Denmark, but does not extend into the north of Alaska. And that's a very interesting fact. In effect, they are claiming the entire Arctic Ocean as their continental shelf in regards to where their Arctic comes up against Canada's and Denmark's shelves. So basically everywhere where the continental shelf on the um, western side of the Arctic ends up until there, Russia claims it. However, Russia here is playing by the rules. And for those of us who are concerned about Russia's flouting of the rule, uh, rules-based orders, I actually take a great deal of comfort in seeing that Russia really is going through an established process in this particular case. And now it's up to, to Denmark and Canada to study the scientific evidence um, submitted by Russia to prepare an appropriate response here. And you might ask what all the fuss is actually about. Um, it's an estimated 19, 90 billion barrels of oil. Nine zero ah. billion barrels of oil. In Resources! Trillions, Yay! Exactly. And trillions of cubic feet um, of natural gas that are thought to lie under the uh, polar oceans. Although... Mm. The central North Pole region is not thought to be especially rich in fossil fuels. It's just like the area around it. What is wrong with us? Exactly. But Canada, Denmark and Russia are likely to be more interested in um, like undersea fuel reserves that are much, much closer to their uh, distinct uh, coastlines because they're really struggling to utilize um, the resources that are much closer to the shore by now. So... Why going all the way to the pole? So that does not much uh, make much sem uh, sense. But claiming the North Pole and, and thus the, the ownership over it has to do with the symbolic importance rather than access to natural resources. This plays into the narrative of Arctic sovereignty, protecting your Arctic territory and upholding sure. your own Arctic presen uh, presence. Being able to extract oil, gas or other minerals from the seafloor in the middle of the Arctic Ocean is so much a long way off technologically that really is not the, the point. The North Pole is more of a symbolic price in all of that's, this. It's more of a show of strength in this context. Exactly. Like way <laughs> on the North Pole. <laughs> yeah. But to conclude this episode, this is a really exciting story about science being used to resolve issues and otherwise might have caused tensions between different states um, in, in prior uh, history. Scientifically, each nation who has actually filed a claim is correct when it asserts that its continental shelf extends beyond the North Pole, which would mean they can each lay claim to the pole itself. All the three countries, Russia, Denmark, and Canada, all the scientists of those countries take the view that it is the same continental shelf all the way around the ocean because North America used to be part of the same continent as Eurasia. North America, including Greenland, separated from the Eurasian continent around 60 million years ago, forming today's Arctic Ocean. So eventually all three nations will need to sit down, start negotiating on the final um, it, delimitations of their territory. It seems and, a bit like, I mean, you can, if, if you only go back in history long enough or in geology, you'll find that we're all related to each other, that we all came from one thing that crawled from the oceans at a time. Um, yeah. 
So I think it's really an exciting chapter of, of, of uh, human history to it just is. witness that. And also what might be the outcome of that. So I'm, I'm really curious. Well, we'll hopefully figure out and it's hopefully going to happen in a peaceful way and uh, not in a, <laughs> in a whatever kind of uh, dangerous confrontation. So... Ah, what a story. Thanks for bringing that to us. So we are at the end of yet another episode of Curiously Polar. Thanks for being around. Thanks for your time. And uh, uh, yeah, it looks like our outro movie is not playing. So anyway... <laughs> A slight tech challenges. So that was it for today. You can find us online at curiouslypolar.com or on the social media at curiouslypolar. And uh, we're looking forward to having you back in a week from now, probably. We'll do our best. Um, quite busy both these days, but um, we'll do whatever we can. Until then, everyone, take care and bye-bye. Bye-bye.